This video looks at the imperfections which mean that labour markets are not necessarily going to be perfectly competitive, focusing specifically on monopsony power and trade unions. Whereas a monopolist is a single seller, a monopsonist is a single buyer in a market. And so in labour market terms, this would mean a single buyer of labour. And on a local scale, we might be thinking about a huge regional firm that employs all of the workers in an area. On a national scale, the NHS will probably be the best example of this employing doctors in the UK. And we're going to start by looking at the different costs to the firm of employing labour by using just this really simple table of those different costs. So we've got the quantity of labour on the left hand side here and then the wage rate. And jumping across to the total cost, which is going to be calculated by the quantity of labour multiplied by the wage rate. Once we've got the total cost, we can calculate the average cost by doing the total cost divided by the quantity of labour. And you'll then see that the average cost is actually going to be the same as the wage rate. We can see that um, being equal in our table here. And if the average cost is equal to the wage rate, that's also equal to the supply of labour because we plot our supply curve for labour with quantity of labour along the x axis and then the wage rate up the y axis. And then we have that upward sloping supply curve, which is going to be going up equal to the wage rate. So the average cost is equal to the wage rate is equal to the supply of labour. And now in a perfectly competitive market, with workers as wage takers and a perfectly elastic supply curve for labour, that average cost, that supply for labour, would also be equal to the marginal cost as well. But that's not quite the case here. And that's because the monopsonist is the only buyer of labour. And in order to attract that additional worker, they will need to increase that wage rate, not just for the additional worker, but also for all of the other workers as well. And that means that that marginal cost will then rise twice as steeply, twice as quickly as the average cost for labour. And you can see that in the table where the average cost goes up from 10 to 11 to 12 and so on. You can see the marginal cost of labour, which is the change in the, in the total cost, when we add an additional unit of labour, that's going from 10 to 12 to 14 and so on. Now we can see the implications of this for the diagram where we have the usual supply curve for labour upward sloping, the usual demand curve for labour, which is equal to the marginal revenue product. But then we have this marginal cost curve for labour, which is rising twice as steeply there as the average cost, the supply curve for labour. And now because the monopsonist is a profit maximizer, they're only going to employ workers up to the point where marginal cost of labour is equal to the marginal revenue product. And that's because before this point, employing an additional worker will increase their profits. And that's because the marginal revenue product, the additional revenue that that worker will bring in is greater than the additional cost of employing that extra worker. But then after this point, the marginal cost of employing the extra worker is greater than the additional revenue that that extra worker will bring in. So it's only at this point here where the two meet that profits from employing those workers are going to be maximised. And we stop there at that point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue product. So it's exactly the same principle there as the marginal cost equals marginal revenue principle for profit maximisation in, mar in, in product markets. But at this quantity of labour, though, they can pay their workers based on the supply curve, which is the average cost of labour. We said that was equal to the wage rate. So the monopsonist is going to employ the quantity of labour to this point here, LM, and they're going to pay those workers WM on the diagram here. Now, in a competitive labour market, the wage rate would be higher at W star, 
and the quantity of labor employed would be higher uh, L star. So that shows you the really important implications of the having the monopsonist employer, the monopsony labor market, is that they will employ fewer workers than the equilibrium in a perfectly competitive labor market, and they will pay those workers a lower wage than would be the case in competitive labor markets. So moving now then from that monopsony situation where the employer has all of the power really to how we could find situations where workers can come together to try and regain some of that power from the employer. And that's generally what happens with trade unions, which are associations of workers which are set up to communicate and bargain with the employers on a collective basis. So rather than just leaving it up to each individual worker. And they're essentially there to look out for the interests of workers. So the types of roles that they're going to fulfill are going to be things like trying to improve paying conditions for the members protecting jobs so whether that's the threat of really large-scale redundancies or unfair dismissal they can negotiate um, and they can bargain with employers to try and stop those things from happening uh, they can try and protect pensions and agreements that will be in place for those and then they provide a really important counterbalance to monopsony power which we've just looked at so we can see how that monopsonist can lead to quite unfavorable outcomes for workers and so the trade union can be quite important in counterbalancing that as we'll see in just a moment with a diagram so we said that one of the really key roles of a trade union is increasing the wages of their workers by using collective bargaining and we can see the impact of that using a diagram. And with this diagram, we're looking at the impact of this in a competitive labor market. So those trade unions push wages up above the equilibrium level, causing that collective bargaining. And you'll notice this diagram is actually exactly the same as the impact we show on the diagram to show the minimum wage, because it's exactly the same, but it's just the cause of this increase in wage is now the trade union rather than government policy. So our initial equilibrium point was here at W and L, and then the trade union comes along and negotiates those higher wages, which pushes the, the wage up higher than the equilibrium level. And the impact of that is that it increases the wage from W to WTU on the diagram here. And it means that the quantity of labor demanded will fall from the equilibrium level here to LD, while the quantity of labor supplied will rise because more workers are now incentivized to work at that higher level of pay. And the outcome of that is that they negotiate these higher wages for the members, which is great, but there is the potential side effect and the downside that while they get those higher wages, because the quantity of labor demanded has contracted whilst the quantity supplied has extended, you get this unemployment here, this surplus of supply of labor over the demand for labor. Now, while that's the case in a competitive labor market, we can see here what's going to happen if we have a monopsony employer and then we introduce a really powerful union that all the workers in an industry would subscribe to into the equation, that would then be called a bilateral monopoly because you've got the trade union, which is a single seller of the labor, but then you've got the monopsonist, which is the sole buyer. So you've got both a sole seller, which is monopoly, and then a sole buyer, which is monopsony. And we can see the outcome here in terms of the diagram, which is going to be a little bit different to the outcome in the competitive market. So as we've seen with the monopsony diagram, the monopsonist is initially going to be at employment LM and wage WM because they are going to employ workers up to that um, profit maximizing level and then they will pay them the wage read across from the supply curve. We've seen that in our standard monopsony diagram. But then we get the introduction of the trade union and the, therefore the bilateral monopoly situation. And what happens in that situation is that it will increase wages. So just like in the competitive market, the trade union pushes the, the wage rate up to this higher level. 
But actually, rather than reducing employment, in this situation, the introduction of the trade union actually counterbalances that monopsony power and it ends up increasing employment to this level LTU here. So the trade off that's there in the competitive market between the lower levels of employment and the higher wage is actually no longer the case. A good just final evaluative comment on this would be that it does depend on where the, new, the newly negotiated wage is. So if the newly negotiated wage is too high, then it might actually end up reducing employment, even in the case of the monopsony market. So thinking now about a final summary of the advantages and disadvantages of trade unions. And one of the key roles that they have, as we've said, is increasing pay, but also increasing working conditions. And this can actually be good news for all parties, for the employer and the employee, because this is really likely to help with motivation and therefore to improve productivity as well. And as we've just seen, actually, in the case of the monopsonist, the trade union can stop that powerful monopsony, which is likely to be driving down wages and driving down levels of employment. And it can ensure that fairer wage and the higher employment and actually lead to better outcomes in the case of that monopsony labour market. It can also help to reduce income inequality because in supporting and bargaining for those who may actually have been on the lowest pay and have the least individual bargaining power, that can help to raise those workers' pay, to improve those workers' conditions, and therefore to reduce that level of income inequality. And then finally, actually on a macro level, by increasing pay and reducing inequality, that can actually help to boost consumption. And increases in spending can actually increase GDP and therefore be positive for employment as well. Now, the main disadvantage of trade unions, we've seen actually in the diagrammatic analysis of competitive labour markets, because we've seen there that it pushes the market away from equilibrium, it distorts those market processes and it causes unemployment. So even though it secures those higher wages for the members, it's going to lead very likely to unemployment as well, which is a significant disadvantage. And on a macro level as well, as the increase in wage could actually potentially lead to a wage price spiral and it could then be responsible for increases in inflationary pressure as well, which are going to be bad news for the economy in general. And then finally, as well as potentially improving productivity through the better conditions, we could actually find that trade unions reduce productivity by resisting advancements in technology. So a lot of these technological advances actually are labour saving. They're about automating processes that humans used to do. And so if the unions oppose this, which they are very likely to do to try and protect jobs, because that's one of their key roles, that will reduce that level of innovation and therefore potentially reducing productivity.